and welcome to this interview series called Myth Busting the Energy Transition. Uh, even in the middle of a global pandemic, it seems like the biggest buzzword for the energy industry is still the energy transition. But this can mean a lot of different things for different people. There are so many different players and viewpoints, so it can be difficult to have one clear view of what the future energy mix is going to be and whether the world is going to achieve its ambitious targets in terms of our environmental, economic, and social objectives. Uh, I am Irina Bonavino. I am part of the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network in Aberdeen, or EIYPN. I'm the vice chair just now. I have a background in doing policy for the energy industry, and I'm currently a change officer in Aberdeenshire Council. And my name is Andrew Poonking. Um, I'm also on the Energy Institute Young Professional Network uh, Committee. I started last year and I've been in the energy industry um, working through uh, various roles. And I'm currently a project engineer working at an oil and gas company for the last five years. And for those who don't know us, we are a group of young professionals uh, that do events for young professionals so they can learn, network and grow in the energy industry. And today we are very lucky to have someone with a fantastic overview of the whole industry. Louise Kingham. So Louise, would you like to introduce yourself? Irina, thanks very much, and Andrew too. Um, yeah, very delighted to join you here in, in this session. My name, as you've heard, is, is Louise Kingham. I'm the Chief Executive of the Energy Institute, which I have been for quite some time now. Uh, and, and one of the best things we've done in, in recent years is really encourage young professionals to get more actively engaged and to give young professionals as a community a voice in discussing energy transition and all sorts of energy system related issues actually. So whilst we concern ourselves with developing over more of a century of knowledge, skills and good practice to support the industry for public good, uh, part of that important conversation is to engage the voice of future leaders on the subjects that were important to us. That's great. And, you know, the last time that you and I spoke was at the end of last year at the EIYPN annual dinner. And you told me that you had just come out of doing events, speaking to hundreds of people at once. And now we're in a global lockdown. So just to start us off, how are you doing? How are you coping? Yeah, fine. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm spending quite a lot of time doing things like this. Uh, which is either talking about the, 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 uh, the opportunities that come from the situation we find ourselves in when we look ahead uh, and then working back from that to, to how are we doing, how are we surviving uh, and, and how are we feeling individually. So I've done a few interviews actually where I've said, you know, it goes up and down a little bit. Sometimes you feel uh, quite buoyant and quite motivated and other days you don't feel quite so lively and engaged but uh, overall we've been doing really well the team at the Energy Institute is working really effectively fortunately we had all of the technology that meant we could just move to remote working relatively easily so I think we've been able to do that a lot a lot easier than others but I am doing daily worldwide updates to the team uh, that's being shared with different volunteer groups and things just to keep everybody connected and engaged because that's the bit I miss. I miss being physically together with people uh, because that's a big part of my job. So we're trying to do that and stay connected using a lot more communication. And you must hear from so many different different sectors and players in the industry. But in your view, what do you think is one of the biggest myths of the energy transition? I think one of the biggest myths that, uh, it, that comes doesn't necessarily follow from, from the companies themselves, but from people who might comment on what the energy sector is or isn't doing. And I think probably the biggest myth is that I hear is that it's just not possible to get to net zero. It's too difficult. You know, we're doomed to fail. We've got so much energy that needs to be provided in the world that we just don't have the capability to do uh, clean energy for everybody in the time that, that it needs to be done. As, as far as the science tells us and advises us, we, we, we have to find that pathway through. Um, so, so that's the one, you know, it's a big one. It's, it, it is a big one and it, it's a fair challenge because it's such a big uh, opportunity and, and task at the same time to be done on, on a global scale. But I do think it's a myth because we have got the technologies, we have got the human ingenuity. And I think the, um, the scale of the current crisis that we're in shows just what happens when you get big disruption uh, and discontinuity, 
how actually you can get a response that that will will garner positive outcomes and i so it just reinforces for me that it's too difficult is a myth and we can get this done so i guess um moving on from that and stemming from that if for example you were a young professional or somebody uh, recently employed within the energy industry just now what might be going through your mind how would this influence your view on the energy transition as a whole well, I'm fortunate in that I get to spend time with lots of you who tell me what you're thinking and what's on your mind. Uh, and, and so, and actually it's a question that we are keen to understand. And as you know, we've got young professional networks globally now, they're popping up fast and growing quite furiously, which is fantastic to see. And so I think, you know, I'm far too old to be a young professional, but I, I do try to keep connected to you to understand what your what your worries about. And I have heard people talk, and, and particularly, actually, the conversation probably began in Aberdeen uh, over a year ago now, when we were talking about the changing narrative and moving to net zero, and what did that all mean for people, particularly people working in the oil and gas industry. And some people were quite anxious about that and quite unsettled and thought that that would mean that, you know, the end of their opportunities for careers in the oil and gas industry, um, you know, worries about whether or not it, they had transferable skills and so on and so forth. And, and I very quickly tried to put pay to that because I, I don't think that is an issue. Uh, and at the time we were talking about it, you know, I was saying, I think it's really critical that the oil and gas industry is at the heart of this energy transition. And, and actually, Steve, as the president of the Energy Institute, has gone on to say even stronger things around we cannot do this transition without the oil and gas being, industry being at the centre of it. So, so that was one, one, one layer of, of, of sort of thought and concern. But I think the current situation with the pandemic and some of the geopolitics around oil pricing, the fall off in demand, uh, and, and much of the talk now about being that demand is, un, is well, either rebound and, and go horribly in the in the wrong way in terms of people that are talking about wanting to manage the demand down and try and protect that as a positive outcome from this situation or the very polar opposite and of course nobody knows nobody knows that so i think as a young yeah. professional you know, if you are um bright smart engaged curious uh, and and digitally aware and savvy and interested and motivated by solving climate challenges and being at the heart of organisations that provide energy services to people every day in whatever form that is, then then you're onto a good thing. You know, it's a fantastically exciting place to be. But I understand that there's a lot of disruption in in the sector at the moment, and that will run on. And it will look different, I think, to the disruption maybe for, say, the oil and gas sector where they've had their downturns and it's been very cyclical when it goes like this. Uh, you know, in the energy supply system, on the retail end, margins are very tight. And so there's not a lot of money in that bit of the system and, and people will be nervous about what the future of work might look like there. And at the same time, you've got people working in renewables or small startups and entrepreneurial businesses that will wonder if the investment's going to flow uh, in order to keep the wheels of those businesses turning and, and provide opportunities for young professionals. So I absolutely appreciate that there are sort of anxieties that this situation creates in, in terms of where we are today. But I also think, going back to the myth-busting point too, that you know, change can also bring positive things. And that's where young professionals are fantastically uh, um, on it because they are very positive as a, as a group anyway they're looking for opportunity and they usually will say uh, individually and in, in, in groups when we meet well why can't we change the way we do things why can't we find better ways to do things and when we've run surveys in in like the energy barometer in the in the institute in previous years and we've asked young professionals in the networks why are you engaged in the energy sector what brought you here in the first place it is about tackling some of these existential challenges and being part of the answer, getting it right for people. So I understand it's an unsettling time, but I would say hang in there um, because for those who, who really want to make that difference, I think there's going to be every opportunity to do so. You know, technolog technological silos are starting to break down now when you think about it. And everyone working from home, uh, for example, you know, you've got industry innovations that are emerging all the time. We've got new funding coming through 
to try and kickstart some of the clean energy projects that we want to try and excel in, not just in the UK, but also in terms of what we might then export and do in partnership in other countries globally. So there are, there are lots of positive things that are still happening. Um, you know, in, in Aberdeen, for example, in February at IP Week, we were showcasing the opportunity for Aberdeen to be the world's first net zero basin. That hasn't changed. That's not gone away. In fact, I saw Andy last week put out the strategy which aligns maximising economic recovery with the net zero uh, policies. So you know, that's fantastic progress. He's pushing really hard on diversity and inclusion and attracting talent and, and encouraging the industry to do exactly the same thing. So lots of the very positive and proactive things are still happening. It's just a little bit buried because the news stories are slightly different at the moment. Lots of disruptions, like you mentioned, not just COVID for everyone, but also the oil price and what that means for the energy transition as a whole. So it sounds like there's scary times for people, but there's also a lot of opportunities. And you hear people talking about, can this mean that we can do better in the future? So on balance, would you say that these disruptions, do they represent an accelerator for the energy in, uh, transition or are they a stumbling block? Well, I am an optimist and I'm, I, uh, I absolutely believe that the outcome from this experience should be to accelerate the transition. And I think when you look at uh, some of the uh, more progressive energy companies that are out there, they have already come out in, in, in some and set, made statements saying that's exactly what's good, what it's going to mean for them. And I think that's, I think it's smart business. I think it's the right thing to do. It's the, it's the honest thing to do. And it's, it's the thing that actually, you know, for the public good, the sector needs to adjust to do. So I'm absolutely convinced that it's about accelerating the transition, not using this experience as an excuse to dig our heels in and, and, and not do the right thing. I think there's a, there's a challenge for governments in that. So I you know, for business, for me, actually it's pretty straightforward. Uh, although from different parts of the, the energy system, there'll be some very different perspectives and, and maybe we can touch on that in, in a minute. But for governments, I think there's a bit more of a challenge. So for me in accelerating the transition as we come through this and, and, and out the other side to what our new reality looks like, governments have got to decide how they are going to stimulate economic recovery and for me, the answer is that, that we build back better, greener. And so when, when governments think about policy frameworks, and Irina, you'll know, because this is an area of work close to your heart, but when, when governments think about how do we design policy frameworks and, and regulatory frameworks so that actually we incentivize the behaviors and the investments and the entrepreneurship we know that business can deliver to give us the right outcomes, to give us the right answers. And that means going pairing right back to looking at what current subsidies do we have in the system? Are they, are they designed correctly to do the things we want them to do? Or should we be looking to adjust those? And, I, and there's also a number of, of, of possible policy interventions which don't exist now, which actually have been on the back burner for too long. Uh, and people were already saying that they were anxious about needing to get on with the transition and needing policy framework intervention to be able to do that. So. I think that that's where the clever policy making is, is, is how do we design those additional interventions as governments, and that's governments everywhere, in order to do this, so that actually when, when they look back at their sort of NDC contributions and they up that in anticipation of the next COP, one would hope, then they can see that they're on a pathway to, to supporting industry and business to make it happen. And also there's something around the role that we have as individuals in society too. You know, this experience has given us a disruption as individual citizens, which, you know, if you'd have described it outside of wartime in a peacetime situation, you probably would have thought, no, that's not going to happen. They're not going to behave that way. That's just not likely at all. Well, it is, it has, and it does, uh, and, and it will continue. So I think it, that those are the reasons, I think, to be enthusiastic about the opportunities for accelerating it. There's an Ipsos Mori poll that's been recently done, which was asking the public uh, in, in Britain uh, whether they thought that climate change was as serious as, as coronavirus, to which they rep responded uh, by two thirds saying that they absolutely did. 
and the majority of those then wanted climate to be prioritized as part of the economic recovery so sometimes in the past when we've had climate policy movement other things have come along and then sort of washed it all away and turned attention to other things I think what we're quite keen to do now is to make sure that that doesn't happen this time around and if that's the public sentiment as individual citizens then we have a real opportunity to to capture the value of that and, and make some changes and ones that governments can do feeling a bit more bold actually that it that it's okay because i think pre this experience of, of, of covid19 governments probably wouldn't have thought that this level of intervention in society was was possible that they would in effect get away with it then it would be palatable but actually it just shows you not that I'm suggesting we want to rerun this in, in the response to climate change, but it does show you how much change can be delivered and how quickly it can be mobilised. So in terms of what needs to be done next, obviously there's the economic recovery and businesses resilience, but the environmental focus is still very much on the front of people's minds and there's an opportunity to keep working at it as we leave the you know, pandemic situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also with, with the UK being the host of, of COP26, if we just sort of stick in the UK for a second, um, you know, it has always wanted as a, as a country to, to play a leadership role on climate and climate policy. And actually, it's made a significant contribution to doing that. And the Energy Institute supported in March a little bit, actually just a couple of weeks before lockdown. Uh, a gathering of all of the climate attaches in the UK government posted all, out, all around the world, came together uh, in Lancaster House and had a, a several days of conference to align the diplomatic um, positioning to be able to go back out into the world and support people in upping their ambitions in preparing for COP26 and coming to the table with, uh, with, with some, new, some new stories to tell and some new ambition to, to share. And so that there's a real opportunity, given that COP has been postponed, uh, but is still planned for in 2021, for that to have not gone away and to continue to be the focus of, of, of what happens next. So, and for the UK to continue to lead by example. So I, I'm hopeful that that doesn't get washed away. Because people are struggling. People are gonna to need to, to, I guess, to help the economy, uh, you know, boost the economy again. And there's that balance between doing the right thing as in try to rebuild in a green manner as opposed to okay well we need let's say cash or the uh, sort of um, you know to help boom the economy again like let's just go back to oil and gas or something like that. how do you how how do we sort of you make sure that balance is right yeah I get, I get the question Andrew I, I think it comes back to how you incentivize people's behavior so for example take VAT Right, so VAT is routinely 20% on things, but why shouldn't it be zero rated if it's energy efficient and you save the customer 20%? Now, if you're buying an expensive white goods, that's, that's not to be sniffed at. Right? So if you're buying a new fridge or a washing machine or whatever, then that, that's, there's a financial advantage in making the right choice. Um, then I think you need to, and then if you take that up to the company level, now, we need to look at the incentives for businesses to invest in different technologies uh, and, uh, and there's probably some, some reason to revisit some of this in the North Sea, for example. Now that the MERS strategy and the Net Zero strategy have been aligned, are the incentives for companies to invest and develop orientated towards doing that in a way which is efficient economically, but also as clean as it can be? You know, and our companies being incentivized through tax relief or whatever it might be, whatever the mechanism might be, to make the right choices in the context of getting to net zero as quickly as we can. So that, that, those are the things that need to happen. Uh, and some of that stuff will be relatively simple to do. And some of it will be really, really complicated because there are, as Arena will know, it, there's, there's a lot of the policy system which actually is quite complicated and, and we've overcomplicated it over the years. So some of it can almost do with being unraveled. It sounds as though you're saying it's really a sort of a cooperation both between government as well as industry as well as society. It's just a cooperation of everybody. It's nobody that's more responsible than another. I, th I think that's right, Andrew. I think that this is doable if everybody plays their part. 
Uh, and you know, if you don't get consumers responding to um, the incentivization to, to change behaviors in the way that we need to, if you don't get businesses being entrepreneurial and producing new products and services that consumers are gonna want that are, are low carbon and help us achieve those climate ambitions. And if you don't have policy and regulatory frameworks that facilitate business to be able to do that, we cannot make it work in the time scale we want to, but all of those things are absolutely possible. And I think this experience over the past few months around the world shows just how much change is possible and just how quickly. And going back to the point of government policies that you mentioned, I, I, I saw in a recent podcast that you hosted for the Energy Institute that there was a mention of the difference between the policy priorities of developed countries, OECD countries, when it came to their net zero targets, these ambitious moves towards the energy transition. And on the other hand, maybe developing countries whose priority is to provide energy to their populations. But in terms of um, this overview that you have of so many different countries through the Energy Institute, for OECD countries like the UK, what is an interesting policy that you think might have a good impact on the energy transition? Well, I, I think there's, there's there's two two layers to this. I mean, the, the, your your question is about what can developing countries do or economies do for for the less developed, uh, and I I like to think there's great opportunity for collaboration there. So that's about the exporting of of knowledge, skills, capabilities, technologies, and facilitating the ability uh, of the the developed economies' experience in order to leapfrog what has been done before and do something far better and far more effective uh, without following that sort of very linear journey that the developed world might have done. So the, the developing economies should have an opportunity to leap two or three technologies ahead uh, and, and be enabled and supported in terms of policy, but also capability and expertise and, and sort of joint ventures and collaborations with uh, businesses and, and, and governments that have already had the experience and I think there's some there's some obvious ones in the UK where we've got the potential to to do that and, and help so how our financial system works how our regulatory systems works uh, our health safety and environmental good practice is world leading um, our technology development our university sector you know there's lots and lots of places where I can think that there is expertise residing that could really help to uh, facilitate and sort of fast track, if you like, the, the developments for, for people in economies that, that haven't had access to some of the things that we have had. And at the same time, that creates an export potential and a, you know, a trade potential. Uh, capability for the UK you know, to the rest of the world. So it's not completely altruistic. Uh, there's also an economic benefit to be had. When you look inside the UK directly, I think there's, um, I would like to see some uh, policy interventions that are at scale that probably look at where business models don't work effectively for companies and therefore a national infrastructure project of some kind would be more effective and more in the public interest than, than otherwise, waiting for businesses or markets to be created. So sorts of things I would think of there are what we do about energy efficiency. You know, we have failed dismally in the UK to do anything effective on energy efficiency over, over the years that I've been involved, which is now nearly mm -hmm. three decades and um, a, a long time and at just every intervention I have seen has largely failed and certainly hasn't been successful at scale. So, uh, it, and it's the first thing we should be thinking about, you know, any developed economy where the energy use is pretty high, there's bound to be a higher level of wastage. And so there's a massive opportunity to just look at how we can be more effective around efficiency and, and demand side management. When you think about some of the newer technologies, um, carbon capture, utilization storage, hydrogen deployment, uh, charging infrastructure uh, for uh, mobility, for personal mobility, electric vehicles, and so on. You know, some of those things are probably more economic and, and more quickly done if they're done as public investment projects as a, or, or at least sort of private public partnerships rather than expecting companies to create markets. 
The flip side of that is things like flexibility and storage in, uh, in, in, in systems on the demand side at say the industrial, commercial, the business customer level, they absolutely should be uh, underpinned by entrepreneurial companies creating uh, interest and developing markets that doesn't necessarily need too much more of way of, in the way of policy or government intervention, but it does need enough interest in order to create the market participation so that we can create the value from it. Uh, and and, it, and if you could if you could mesh those sorts of in, incentives and policy interventions together, I think you would start to see change at scale. That's quite interesting, actually. So, I mean, to uh, and it's, I think that, that personally, I think that point about the sort of energy efficiency it is quite interesting because I guess regardless of that, I would take it that you know the energy demand is still going to be going up per se. So it's it could couple with helping to, you know, facilitate the actual energy transition itself. Because, you know, I, I, as far as I'm aware, you know, you have these green projects that come in uh, to supply energy, but then obviously, yeah, it's because the supply is so, so large, you know, you'll have like a gas plant or something like that to facilitate that. So it's a real opportunity there. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess on that, uh, you know, if for the next generation or, or people who might be wanting to get into the industry, you, I mean, Personally, what do you think could help to you know, motivate the the um, next generation to get into the energy industry as a whole? I mean, from what we discussed here, it does sound quite positive and there's real opportunity, especially in the current situation that we are in for, you know, development um, and opportunities to get into that. So if you were to talk to the next generation now, what would you say? I guess I, I touched on a little bit of it earlier where I, I would say, you know, this is this is one of the most fascinating and exciting sectors to to be involved in. And, it, and if your motivation is to do some public good and, and be at the heart of change, which affects real positive improvements for people, for humanity around the world, working in this sector is, is, is really going to help you achieve that ambition. Um, I think that the the interesting times that we have around the transition in terms of the different businesses that are popping up, uh, the way in which established traditional businesses are changing and, and reinventing themselves, all of that creates a lot of opportunity for individuals. So I think it's about, and the things I would be saying would be around sort of getting yourself kitted up and tooled up so that you're well positioned to, to to sell yourself to those companies and, and and sort of start to build the and deliver on your own ambition that you've created for yourself so so what would i suggest so things i would talk about with people would be you know being uh uh analytically savvy being digitally savvy uh, being curious uh asking lots of questions and you know always being intrigued about why things are done in the way that they are um challenging being a little bit challenging and 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 in, inquiring i think is a positive thing i think sometimes you have to know when to not do that <laughs> but most of the time i think that it's it's welcomed you know i love nothing more than for people to teach me uh 30 years into to my career i think if you uh, as a leader ever stop thinking that you don't have anything else to learn then you're you should really stop leading you know your your time is done so and, and so actually you know le learning from people who are at the beginning of their career as much as people who have experience is equally valuable because you learn very different things so so i think in terms of the school skill set obviously it's about thinking where it is that you want to be in the sector and and and, and whether or not there are functional capabilities and skills that you need to develop but equally leaders are looking for people all the time with potential and so those are that that's a slightly different set of, of of sort of characteristics and traits beyond skills and knowledge that you might have and i think sort of the um the desire to be curious uh the desire to engage to be collaborative to be agile flexible you know so it makes you very deployable and uh, people that lead companies tend to like that kind of talent because it, it makes it easy to build an organization and be successful. Thanks a lot, Louise, for your time today. We really appreciate it on behalf of the Energy Institute. Um, I think there was quite some good insights um, and points there that, that were raised. Thank you, Irina, as well, uh, for your time.
I don't know if you have any closing remarks, please. I, I guess there's probably just a few things. So for the young professionals, um, you know, you're already pretty good at connecting, engaging, building communities, building networks. Uh, we're in looking at introducing a new mentoring service in, in uh, the coming weeks, which is really designed to encourage energy professionals that are in membership of the Institute to link up and hook up with senior members and fellows that are in leadership positions and mentor each other. Yeah, it's a two way street. So I would really urge people to look out for that. And, and when all of you as associate members of the EI are, are looking at what we're up to, keep an eye out for that one, because I think it's going to be fantastic. And given that people now are very used to working like this and meeting like this, I suspect we can probably do an awful lot more with the on online mentoring than we were initially planning to. Um, the fact that we're also starting to reach a wider audience because we're working this way and producing webinars and you know the YPN community are already all over that and, and building their own uh, series you know it, it just increases our reach and our capability and for you the networks and the opportunities so I would just urge anyone that's connected with a, a young professionals network who isn't an associate member already to to to, to get involved uh, sign up to that start seeing some of the other things that are available to you and, and really take the benefit uh, from it so that we can continue to see you grow and be tomorrow's leaders in the energy sector because that's what we want to see so yeah i want to just thank all the listeners obviously all the uh, people listening to this video uh, without your contributions you know this wouldn't be possible um, this is uh, one of the videos in a series event that we have for uh, the myth busting the energy transition. So be sure to check out the other videos on our social media websites. And as they follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, and feel free to get involved. Thanks again for everybody for their time this afternoon.